Welcome, everyone, to the Pick 6 Podcast. This is John Breach, and I'm in the host chair today because Will Brinson is still on vacation. He's taking the week off. He's been out binging horse documentaries on Netflix. Uh, That is not how I would spend my vacation, but to each their own. I'm not going to judge him. Uh, Even though Brinson's out, we're going to still continue with our All-32 series. And today, that means we're going to be talking about the Tennessee Titans. And joining me to talk Titans football is someone who could potentially be my new best friend because we're practically neighbors in Nashville. And that is Teron Davenport from ESPN. Uh, Teron, how are you doing today? How have you been holding up in these crazy pandemic times? Hey, I'm doing well, man. I've been holding up, you know, the family. We're keeping it going and just trying to maintain some degree of normalcy. As you know, you know, it's, it's beautiful here in Nashville. So it's a good opportunity to get out, but you still have to be socially distant. So I have to observe that. Yeah, definitely. There are a lot of outdoor things to do in Nashville. You know, the Titans also have been kind of crazy this off season. Uh, you know, they've been a lot of headline news grabbing things, whether it was signing Ryan Tannehill, franchise tagging, Derek Henry, uh, losing Jack Conklin. There's a bunch of things and we'll get to everything. Uh, but you know, what's on, you know where I am going to start. I am going to start with the Tom Brady sweepstakes. Let's just cover mm-hmm. that real quick. I know Mike Vrabel has been asked about this a few times this off season, uh, but how close do you think the team was to landing Brady, or do you think the whole time it was we're we're re-signing Tannehill and the Brady thing was just a smokescreen? I think their mindset all along was to re-sign Tannehill, and it's something that they executed quickly, and it makes sense when you look at what happened with him. There was a total turnaround on offense. Since he became the starter, they averaged 30.4 points a game, third most in the NFL. And on top of that, their red zone presented, it skyrocketed from 18th in the league to number one in four weeks. Then they ended at at number one with 72% touchdown scoring in the red zone. A lot of that had to do with Ryan Tannehill. So they really were convinced that that was what they needed to duplicate this year. And that's why they signed him. Yeah. And I, you know, obviously we saw him put up some incredible numbers. He had a high QB rating, high completion percentage. Do you think what he did in 2019 is sustainable going forward because he's never really put two strong seasons together. Yeah, I don't think that's completely sustainable because to be honest with you, what he did last year as far as completion percentage and average per completion, it's only been done two other times. And, you know, only Sammy Ball and Joe Montana had an over 70% completion percentage and averaged at least nine yards per completion with 100 attempts. So I don't think that's going to be repeated. But I think they can have a degree of success. I think he will stay healthy. Uh, if he can stay healthy, they'll, they'll be fine on offense. I actually just wrote about that on ESPN.com. There's some things working in their favor, whether it's uh, Derrick Henry, A.J. Brown, John o. Smith coming along, Corey Davis in a contract year. And uh, obviously, you know, just the, the continuity with O.C. and Q.B. So I think he can continue it. Yeah, and I think uh, that continuity is huge because I think what we had with Arthur Smith was a thing where Marcus Mariota just never looked looked really comfortable in that offense. And now that Tannehill has another year uh, in this system, do you think he, you know, he might not be able to sustain those numbers, but do you think he's going to look more comfortable out on the field, uh, you know, with, with another year with Arthur Smith? Yeah, exactly. That's really where it is, and that's what he did last year. He was very cool and and composed and comfortable and mainly confident. And that's something that you didn't see Ryan Tannehill play with as much in the past, the confidence. And it really showed in the shots. You go to the the Colts game, the second Colts game, that is, where they went play action. They took that shot. He threw a a dime to Khalif Raymond for a touchdown. And then you look at the game against the Ravens. He did the same thing. And it was right after they stopped him on a fourth down. And Arthur Smith, that showed growth from Arthur Smith, but it also showed confidence in uh, Ryan Tannehill. And then Ryan Tannehill showed confidence by delivering that ball and the money. It's hard to to only be able to take two or three deep shots and and hit on those as consistently as he did. So I really feel like he's going to be in good shape with with some continuity for sure. Yeah, it seems like a lot of people – 
really from a national perspective, didn't really appreciate how well Ryan Tannehill played at times last year. But let's forget about Tannehill for a second. Let's talk about the big dog this offseason, and that is yeah. Derrick Henry. You know, he gets hit with the franchise tag. I'll just ask you simply, man, how do you think this plays out? you think they get a long-term deal done, or do you think he plays on the tag? I think they get a deal done. They're working towards it. That's what I've heard from the GM and head coach in Zoom, but also behind the doors. I've heard that also. So make no mistake about it. They want him around. The whole running back, not paying concept is something that they don't fully buy into, at least with Derrick Henry. And I think the main thing is when you look at Henry, he's coming off a rushing title. He's coming off one of the best playoff stretches by a running back ever. I'm not talking about the last five years. I'm talking about ever. You know, when you're accounting for around 69% of the offense, you really show that you have value for the team. So when you pair that with having a guy like Jimmy Sexton as the agent, now it's okay. I have a powerful agent. I'm coming off a record, you know, a year in which, you you know, I led the league in rushing. I need something to set the record as far as contracts are concerned, whether it be average per year, whether it be most guaranteed money, whether it be most fully guaranteed money, something has to be the highest ever for the running back because you know how contracts go. What have you done for me lately? And the guy who most recently had success and is up for a contract typically gets the biggest deal. Yeah, and in case anyone listening has already forgotten, Derrick Henry averaged 148.6 yards per game in the 2020 postseason. He was steamrolling everyone. Obviously, 195 yards against that Ravens defense, and, and and that was just, you know, he was such a huge part of why they were able to get to the AFC title game. You just mentioned, kind of mentioned the numbers there, Saran. What do you think? Do you think he is going to get Christian McCaffrey number and, and maybe get up into the echelon of being the highest paid player? Or do you think he's going to fall maybe below Zeke uh, at that 15 million number and fall somewhere between, say, 13 and 15? I think he's going to fall below Zeke at that 13 to 15 average, which is fine because that's that's your funny money, right? It, the average you could do a lot with that uh, at the back end of the contract. You know, you could you could have it go up to make the average right. I think really where it's going to be is he's going to get a lot of guaranteed money, and I'm talking fully guaranteed against roster injury and and performance. I think that's where he's going to be. And I believe, if I'm not mistaken, Zeke Elliott was around 32, not fully guaranteed. I mean, not overall guaranteed, but fully guaranteed. And I, I think Derrick Henry will be able to beat that, which means that it probably over the first two years of the deal, you know, most of that will be paid off. So if they want to release him in the third year, they could do so with a minimal cap hit. Yeah, and as you said, Derrick Henry is such a big part of this offense. I, you know, Obviously, that philosophy is out there that you shouldn't pay running backs, but this is a unique situation. And right. you know, I wouldn't be surprised if he gets that kind of money. Now, let me ask you this, because obviously they got two key guys back with Tannehill, Derrick Henry. They lost Jack Conklin. From an offensive standpoint, do you think they will be better than they were last year, worse than they were last year, or roughly about the same? I think overall, offensively, they'll, that's tough, man, because <laughs> Tajay Sharp is not around. And uh, you look at, you know, I, I think they are going to be better because I'm projecting a, a much improved year for uh, Corey Davis. And I, I think having him really emerge as a true 1A slash 2 receiver to A.J. Brown, because all the coverage is going to go to A.J. And I think that's going to give Corey Davis more of an opportunity to emerge. And I think John o. Smith, I'm going to say they're going to be better. I watch out for, for I call them the Smurfs. you got Khalif Raymond, Cam Batson, and Rashard Davis. You put all three guys together, you probably get about 13 feet of, uh, of men. <laughs> but uh, I, I, I would say watch out for those guys because I think they're going to emerge as, as, as deep threats. Yeah, and obviously, you know, Derrick Henry gets all the – the spotlight seems like on the offensive, they do have quite a few weapons that people don't even think about. Now let's go to the defensive side of the ball really quick. There's been a lot of chatter about Judevian Clowney and maybe him signing in Tennessee. Do you think that has any chance of happening? I think it has a great chance of happening. And you look at just the way things have gone. As you get further and further into the offseason and closer to training camp, the best thing an organization has working for them is familiarity. And you look at Vrabel, he worked with Jadavian Clowney. You look at 
Shane Bowen, he was Clowney's position coach in Houston. Anthony Midget was on the defensive staff as a DB coach. And Clowney's best friend in the NFL just so happens to be Jonathan Joseph, who the Titans just signed. So I say it's likely. I, I think it's probably the, the best bet as far as where he would go. Yeah, I think it's going to end up being with the Titans. Yeah, and for those people who don't know, one of Clowney's best seasons came in 2017 with the Texans, Precisely. and Vrabel was, yeah, the defense coordinator that year, as uh, Teron was just alluding to. Uh, we are going to take a quick break, and then when we get back, we'll talk a little bit more about the defense. Uh, we'll tackle one positional battle, and we'll find out how good Teron thinks the Titans are going to be this year. Uh, so stick around. All right. Welcome back. And uh, we were just talking about Jadevian Clowney and the defense. So let's stick right there for a second. It seems like we've spent so much time talking about the team's offense between Tannehill, Henry, uh, losing Jack Conklin. There's, that's been the headline this whole offseason. But there's been some big changes on this defense. Seems like the story that's not getting enough attention in Tennessee is Jarrell Casey's out. Logan Ryan's yeah. out. Uh, you know, they didn't hire a new defensive coordinator, decided not to release, uh, replace Dean P. So I'll ask you this. What do you think of that decision uh, to not replace the defensive coordinator? Well, I, I think it's it's actually good because now you, you're going to have continuity there. Make no mistake, Vrabel, Coach Vrabel had a, a big influence on what happened on the defense. So we got to talk to him a bit uh, earlier this week, and he said when he's not in that defensive room, Shane Bowen is going to be the guy speaking to the defense. So he's going to continue to spread around. But I think it's good because you're not bringing in a new coordinator who has his own concepts and ideologies that he likes to stick to. So the terminology remains the same. Everything is, is, is the same. So that's good. But then in addition to that, what they did was uh, bring on Jim Hazlitt, who replaced Tyrone McKenzie, who was an outstanding inside linebackers coach. He's now with the Lions. But with Hazlitt, you bring – that experience. That's another guy who has spent what the amount of time that a lot of these guys have been alive. He spent coaching. So there's experience there. And that's something that, you know, is, is good to have. And that's a, a voice of reason that Vrabel could talk to when they're on the sideline. And of course, during the week as they're doing install. And then, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, the, the, they lost two kind of uh, guys. It seems like they have a little bit left in the tank and Logan Ryan, who left in free agency and uh, Jarrell Casey, who got traded. Did either yeah. of those moves surprise you that they, they just decided to dump both of them? The Casey one uh, really shocked me. I, I was very surprised by that because I figured he would be around. And uh, that's the one that, that really stood out. And I mean, anybody that knows the Titans, they, they were surprised by that. Logan Ryan, I kind of figured that was a direction that they were going. Um, if you brought him back, it was going to be at least $10 million. And I, I just didn't see, knowing that Adore Jackson was going to be up soon, I, I didn't think that they were going to you know, go ahead and, and re-up Logan Ryan. Also knowing that Malcolm Butler was coming back with a pretty, pretty big number, too, with $12, 13000000 million. So, unfortunately, you can't pay everybody. Yeah, and, and Casey, you know, he had been a full-time starter basically since 2011. His entire career has been yeah. in Tennessee. You know, and he said a couple of weeks ago that he felt like the Titans disposed him like trash – what do you think, <laughs> you know, like, why do you think Tennessee just decided to move on? I think it's it's one of those things where you have the, the Patriot complex, where uh, an organization would rather get rid of a guy a year early than a year late. And they figured they wanted to clear up cap space. I honestly think that that deal was done to be able to at least sit at the table with Clowney. I, I really, I, I feel that way. And they won't say that, of course, but that's the way I look at it, because if they didn't get that 11.5 off the books, they wouldn't even be able to approach Clowney. And the thing is, if they don't sign Clowney, they could turn around and use that money to extend some guys ahead of time, whether it's John o. Smith or if it's uh, a guy like um, uh, Jayon Brown. You know, those are things that they could do, but it's just going to be so hard replacing him because, you know, he was that guy that played all the way from zero to five tech. He even stood up and rushed uh, as a stand-up rusher, you know, off the edge. So they're going to have to replace that. Fortunately, they were able to bring in Vic Beasley, you know. But the thing is, when you have a, a, a Jarrell Casey, Jeffrey Simmons was like the Batman to that, right? So now Simmons steps into the – or excuse me, the Robin to that. Simmons now steps into the Batman role 
who's going to be the, the Robin to Simmons. Yeah, and I do like your theory there because, like, you're not going to go tell Clowney maybe you're going to offer him 13 or $14 million when you only have $2 million in your bank account. You know, right. The numbers have to add up eventually. So let's let's move to uh, the biggest positional battle heading into training camp. Do you think that's at right tackle trying to find Jack Conklin's replacement, or do you think it's somewhere else on the field? Yeah, I, I don't think it's there because I think Dennis Kelly is, is firmly entrenched, at least for the first half of the season, as the starter at right tackle. Isaiah Wilson will eventually get to compete and take over at some point. But if I look at the biggest competition – uh, I probably would say for that nickel spot, but the thing that's interesting is they have a, a, an assortment of, of flavors to, to go in there. You need someone to run with the, the speedy slots like Marquise Brown or, you know, running vertical routes. We have a Dory Jackson to do that. You you also have Christian Fulton, but then you, you need somebody to match up with the bigger guys that, that line up in the slot. And that's when you might have a Monty Hooker come or, or even have him go against the, the, bigger like the move tight end so I think there's a competition there as far as who's going to be the starter but uh because their basic starting package is is a sub sub package so that's where I I see it being a, a big competition yeah and their secondary is pretty loaded and that really is the one mystery spot uh right now all right Teron, I'm gonna put you on the spot uh we're gonna just go with a quick early Titans prediction they're over under in Las Vegas is eight and a half wins uh, according to our friends at William Hill Sportsbook let me ask you this what do you think this team's ceiling is if everything goes right this season do they win the division how many wins can they get yeah I say that if everything goes right they win the division and go 11 and 5 I have them at at 10 and 6 so you know if you're if you're a betting guy hammer that 8.7 hammer that (laughs) over because you'll be able to cash in uh, Teron's got the betting advice. We love that here. And then I'll ask you, uh, you know, there's always a chance that the wheels fall off the wagon. Tannehill regresses. The offense falls apart. If that happens, what do you think the worst case scenario is here? Uh, well, I, I would say I would say six and I'll go the op- opposite. I would go six and ten would be the worst case scenario because that defense and the way that they they play on offense as far as running the football and ball control, minimal uh, turnovers and Brett Kern, who's the MVP of the defense, the punter. I, I think they're always going to be in games. Yeah, Kern is definitely a weapon. And my personal prediction is nine and seven because I'm wussing out and they've done it four years in a row. So why not <laughs> one more year? Uh, Teron, thanks so much for joining us, jumping on the Pick Six podcast to talk about the Titans. You can follow him on Twitter at T Davenport underscore. NFL. So definitely jump on Twitter, do that. And also remember to download, subscribe, and leave a five star review wherever you uh, listen to podcasts. Write about how awesome of a guest Tehran was. Uh, leave a five star review saying, I'm a much better host than Will Brinson. I will also accept that. Uh, and we'll be back yeah. in a few soon. Thanks, guys.